Hello everyone, welcome back, and we're going to be talking about pain management, pre-hospital pain management. There have been a few protocol changes, but for the most part it'll be a refresher. Uh, the major changes to our protocols have been the uh, some initial max, uh, especially around intranasal. Uh, medication administration since you usually need a larger dose intranasally for it to be effective. And you can see our protocol looks mostly the same. Some areas that you might want to pay attention to is um, under the background section, the initial patient management section, you'll see that there is a little note um, about how to administer intranasal doses and how if you're given a larger volume than you need to, because remember you want to limit the intranasal dose to smaller volumes, um, 0.5 mLs are, is preferred um, with 1 mL per nair being the max. Um, this is just telling you that you can administer you know, half of the dose initially if it's over the max intranasal volume, and then wait a few minutes to give the remainder, um, just because if you give too much at once, then it's going to just drip into the uh, posterior pharynx uh, instead of going where you want it to in the vascular area um, of the nose. Um, you'll see that um, the max intranasal ketamine dose um, has changed, uh, as well as the, uh, the IV dose. I believe that's different um, as well. Um, and also there is an alternative route to administering ketamine um, IV, and that is diluting it. Uh, your your dose in a 10 ml syringe and administering over it over five to ten minutes. Now, ideally, to um, to avoid the uh, psychoperceptual effects of giving it too fast, it, it it would be best to administer it via IV drip. But I can appreciate how there might be some situations where uh, it's not readily available, and ketamine might still be the preferred. Um, analgesic that you want to give. Now, what I'm hoping to provide you in this training is one more comfortable comfortability, familiarity, um, and to kind of change the paradigm a little bit if you're not already in tune with this paradigm. Um, and that is of a multimodal strategy to treating pain. Um, <clears throat> So it can be hard with all of, of all of our different options or analgesic strategies that we provide uh, to determine which one's best. And I think that the answer is that there might not be one single medication that is the best. Okay. Now a multimodal strategy involves using moderate doses of different agents. Um, then you can maximize the efficacy and minimize the toxicity or historically we've given um we've we've treated pain with just these very large doses of single opioids to get any pain relief um now a multimodal therapy when i say multimodal multimodal um, i'm i'm meaning we're given an opioid and we're given an inset or we're given an inset and a uh, and acetaminophen and an opioid. So um, it admit, it involves administering more medications. This can be confusing. Uh, why are we using all these when we can just use one? But there's a very large basis for this evidentiary basis. Um, confirming that multimodal therapy is reasonably robust. Uh, there's a lot of randomized control trials now largely performed in operative and post-operative patients. Now the situation is going to dictate what you give and 
we're going to briefly talk about what might be better for certain particular situations. Um, <clears throat> much of what we're talking about is uh, came from an evidence-based guideline for pre-hospital pain management. They provided some recommendations, and we'll talk about some of the strategies that they recommend. So the first thing to decide is what is our goal in pain management? Well, first of all, our goal is multimodal options to treat pain because if we use different things, all right, the pain comes from different etiologies, all right? So we're using these different medications that might treat certain types of pain better than others, but um, <clears throat> mostly it can be difficult to determine what analgesic is going to be more effective for that pain. And it's got to be based on the pain severity, the patient's history, the hemodynamic status, and the choice of the patient. Some patients wouldn't want an opioid um, unless we, we do all of this. So we use we, we come up with a strategy based on severity, history, hemodynamics, patient choice, unless it's contraindicated or the patient refuses. So I do want to talk about pain management disparities. Okay. Um, there are a lot of different studies looking at how patients of different um, genders, ethnicities are treated. Uh, when it comes to managing their pain. Now, I'm sure you can guess, but white patients are significantly more likely to receive opioids or long bone fractures, um, and pediatric patients were less likely to receive opioids for acute pain. Um, white patients are more likely to receive opioid analgesics in the emergency department or at discharge. Um, and they're less likely to re receive insets. Um, women, uh, compared to men, are significantly less likely to receive opioid analgesics. So there is a disparity when it comes to uh, managing patients' pain. And I think that it is important that we, we maintain that awareness when we're treating someone's pain um, to kind of um, kind of cross-check ourselves and our partners uh, to ensure that we're providing um, pain management similarly to certain demographics as we are others. Now, pain management in children is an emerging topic. They are even developing... Um, performance metrics based on what children's pain scores are and whether or not EMS treated their pain. Not only is it, are we less likely to treat pain in children, but we're actually less likely to document pain as a symptom, uh, and very few actually receive any form of analgesia. Um, it is worse for minority pediatric patients with long bone fractures. Um, in one study, it says that minority children were found to be more likely to receive any analgesic and more likely to achieve um, two point or greater reduction in pain compared to non-Hispanic white children, but were less likely to receive an opioid or ultimately achieve optimal pain reduction. Now, a lot of the problems, I think, surrounding pain management in children is due to um, some myths, uh, common myths uh, about pain in children is that infants can't feel pain. Some people say that children experience less pain than adults. Uh, some say children will... Um, uh, that they recover more quickly from pain. Um, and some people think that opiates always cause respiratory depression in children. And if that's something you've heard or something that you prescribe to, 
then that is wrong. Now, can we evaluate how much pain a child is in? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. There are different pain scales based on the age. So the FLAC scale uh, was developed for um, kids less than four years old or for older children with developmental delays. Um, this involves looking at uh, mostly motor activity. So, you know, we're looking at their face. The F stands for face, L, legs, A, activity, C, cry, and the second C in flack is consolability. So, you know, obviously with the face, if they are clenching, clenching their jaw, quivering their chin, um, then they would score a two, which is the highest that you can get on the flack scale. Uh, if they're kicking or drawing their legs up, then that also gets a two. Um, and I'll let you pause it and look at the rest of this scale so that you can uh, become familiar with it to kind of quantify how much pain a young child is in and determine um, whether or not they need uh, pain management. Now, something that you're probably more familiar with in terms of pain scales is FACES, which was developed for kids ages 4 to 12. And that's your typical face facial uh, pain scale where the, uh, the red face that's frowning is the worst pain and the dark green that's smiling is the, uh, the, the, the least pain. There are also pain scales for patients with dementia, the Abbey pain scale and the pain ad, pain aid. There's no I, painted, pain, pain ad. Um, pain scales were both developed for patients with dementia, and it looks at, um, believe it or not, some similar things to what the FLAC scale looks at. It looks at the body language, consolability, facial expression, um, but it also includes the breathing. So uh, are they hyperventilating? Do they have labored breathing? Um, and it also looks at their vocalization uh, for patients with dementia. So um, sometimes if they're in pain, they might moan, groan. Uh, if they're in more severe pain, they might loudly moan or groan and cry. Trending a pain scale, all right, or looking at pain scale trends is greater than a single measurement. And when we're considering if we're going to treat pain, let's say on a patient that is saying they have 10 out of 10 pain, but they're sitting semi-fowlers playing a video game on their phone. They're not crying. They're not writhing around. They have normal facial expressions. And you ask them what their pain is, and they say it's a 10. Um, we do not say, and our protocol doesn't say that if the score is a 10, regardless of what other signs and symptoms the patient is displaying, that you have to treat it, that you must treat it, okay? Um, nothing in our protocols says that. Um, but what I will ask you to do is reconcile how severe they say their pain is with other visible signs. Now, if someone says their pain's at 10 out of 10, but they have no other visible signs of that pain, so they're not in any distress, they're easily able to be redirected, I might give that patient an oral analgesic, okay, Tylenol or ibuprofen. Um, whereas a patient who has a lower pain number on the pain scale, that is writhing around in distress, can't be distracted from their pain, but they say it's a five or a four, I might be more inclined to treat that patient's pain more aggressively. Now, obviously, if you document that the patient has a 10 out of 10 pain, you need to document how you reconciled 
that with the other visible signs of pain that they were displaying or not displaying. But we have to be very careful when we're doing this so that we don't insert our own biases into what patients we treat, uh, we treat for pain. So just a few things to think about in terms of assessing a patient who's complaining of pain and in documenting that assessment. Now, um, I believe it was uh, NASIMSI, National Association of State EMS Educators, that came up with this guidance document. Maybe it was NASIMSO. Either way, it was one of the NASIM something. Um, <clears throat> their number one recommendation, so what they did was they come up with these clinical questions saying, if you have this patient and or this patient, how should you manage their pain? What route, what medication, what dose? And they came up with these treatment recommendations. So the first question deals with, should you, if you've got a pediatric patient in pain with no IV access, should you give intranasal versus IM or IV analgesia? They recommended in favor of intranasal fentanyl over intramuscular or intravenous opioids in the treatment of moderate to severe pain in pediatric patients prior to IV access. It, and I will agree with that statement that it is perfectly okay if you have, let's say, a pediatric patient with a single long bone fracture, stable vital signs, uh, maybe you're evaluating them on the flax scale, uh, or if they're older than four, you're evaluating them on the basis scale. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate to treat them with intranasal pain medications with close monitoring for any uh, respiratory depression or hypoxia, uh, which would be a part of respiratory depression. So because you don't have to start an IV, you're not trying to restrain this kid who's possibly afraid of measles, which could likely or possibly exacerbate their injury and their symptoms. So let's talk briefly about intranasal medication administration. I think the biggest question we have to ask is, does it even work? It is problematic given intranasal medications. Um, <clears throat> because the dose is different than what we're accustomed to given. We have to give larger doses and smaller volumes. Now, fortunately, I think the concentration of ketamine um, and fentanyl that we have works well both for uh, intranasal and intravenous and even intramuscular administration. Okay. Um, and I'm going to show you how this works works out. But in general, the evidence for intranasal medications, uh, intranasal pain medication administration is the largest in kids because almost regardless of what concentration you have, um, the dose will be smaller because you're given less of it. So it is um, usually easier to give the intranasal medication in kids, all right? Now, when you're given intranasal pain medications, you wanna, of course, split the dose, use both um, not nostrils. Um, if you're given a larger dose, or which would give you theoretically a larger volume, um, give it in small aliquots spaced a few minutes apart until you reach the initial desired dose, okay? Another thing that we uh, might mess up when we're given medications intranasally, the medication needs to atomize. So in order for it to atomize, you have to give it um, uh, faster than you would expect. We're not slamming it, uh, but we're also not trying to slowly push it in. Uh, the, your technique matters. Uh, so when we're given this, you want to administer it towards the ear on the same side. Uh, there's a vascular uh, plexus and there's a bundle of nerves that penetrate directly into the 
cranium. Um, and if you direct it appropriately, then it should uh, hit those nerves and provide a faster effect. Um, also, there is 0.1 milliliters of dead space in the atomizer. Why, did th why does this matter? Um, as we'll see here in just a second, if I am, let's say I'm given 50 micrograms of uh, intranasal ketamine, and I am pulling up, um, let's say I pull up an ML. If, sorry, I'm given 50 milligrams of intranasal ketamine, and I'm pulling up a full ML, which should be 50 milligrams, correct? If the concentration is 50 milligrams per ML. That means that there is 5 milligrams in each 0.1 milliliter. So because 5 times 5 is 25, uh, and then that would be 0.5 mLs, and then times that by 2, and that is 1 full ml. So I am actually decreasing my dose by 0.1 ml unless I account for that and add an additional 0.1 ml to that dose. So whatever your dose is, you want to pull up, draw up an additional 0.1 milliliter to give that. Now for an adult, the difference the difference, you know, between 45 and 50 milligrams intranasally might not be that much, but if we're treating a kid and we're trying to give, if we're trying to give, you know, 10 milligrams of intranasal fentanyl. Hi everyone, I'm sorry for that mistake. Uh, I meant to say 10 milligrams of intranasal ketamine. Uh, I apologize again and thank you. And we draw up let's say 0.2 mLs, which would be 10 milligrams, then we are actually cutting that patient's dose in half. So account for dead space when you're giving this. Okay, so let's do some mad math. Now bear with me as I work through this with you. Let's imagine that we're wanting to give intranasal pain medication. Okay, and... Um, Let's just say for a second that we want to give uh, intranasal ketamine to a 100 kilogram patient. So uh, a, fairly, um, a fairly large patient. Now our dose of intranasal ketamine is one milligrams per kilogram intranasally. So that would be 100, 100 milligrams, okay? So that would be two milliliters, however, the max initial is 50 milligrams. Max initial is 50 milligrams. So that'd be 25 milligrams per nair or 0.5 mLs per nair because we want to give a full milliliter because the concentration is 50 milligrams for every milliliter. Now my question to you is what size syringe would you use? Would you use a 1cc syringe or the next size up, which would be a 3cc syringe. Well, I would want to use a 3cc syringe, and I'll explain why. And you might want to know why, because if we're given a milliliter, I can use a 1cc syringe and draw it up to, draw it up to 1 ml. Problem is, we have to account for 0.1 milliliter of dead space, so I would actually need to draw up just a little bit more. And then, you know, for intranasal ketamine, I'd be given half a milliliter per there, so that would be perfect. That would be perfect. Now, this would work all the way up until you get to a patient or get down to a patient who is 50 kilograms. And if you go beyond that, I would want to preferably switch to a 1cc syringe, a 1cc syringe. Because if my patient, let's say, is, um, let's say that they are 40 kilograms, 40 kilograms. All right, so what would my dose be? Well, my dose would be 40 milligrams because it's one milligram per kilogram intranasally. All right, um, so I would want to give 40 milligrams, add, um, add, 0.1 mLs, okay, 
So how do I think of this in my head? Well, if I've got uh, 50 milligrams in one cc, all right, and I divide that up, I should have five milligrams, all right, five milligrams per 0.1 ml. So that would be five to 0.1, 10 to 0.2, 15 to 0.3, 20 to 0.4, 25 to 0.5, 30 to 0.6, 35 to 0.7, 40 to 0.8, 40 to 0.8. So my volume would be 0.8 mLs, which would be 40 milligrams for a 40 kilogram patient. And I would want to give an additional 0.1 milliliter, so I would give 0.9 because there would be 0.1 mLs of of dead space. Now, <clears throat> if I am giving fentanyl, uh, for the most part, it is 50 mics per mL. My max initial is 100 mics. All right, so it's kind of the same thing, right? Um, however, my volume is going to be higher because if I've got a 100 kilogram patient. If I've got a 100 kilogram patient, my dose is going to be 100 mics because my max is different. So I would be given two milliliters to that patient. So then I would want to use a three cc syringe. If my patient's 50 kilograms, my patient is 50 kilograms, one mic per kilogram would be um, 50 micrograms, okay, which would be a full ml plus the 0.1 of dead space. So again, only when they would get below 50 kilograms would I need to go to a 1cc, 1cc syringe. Something to note with any intranasal medication administration is that um, it does take a little bit longer to work, all right? But the good thing about intranasal medications is that they're very safe. It takes longer to get to a therapeutic threshold, um, but you rarely peak above the respiratory depression threshold when giving medications intranasally. So it is safer, it takes longer to work, but it also generally stays in the system longer um, than, say, would uh, uh, intravenous analgesics. Um, so it'll take some time to work. So if I think I'm going to give it, then I want to give it early. But the good thing is that it shouldn't take me as long to administer it intranasally. So however many minutes you think it would take you to start an IV, two, three, four, five, I don't know. It depends on if you get it the first attempt or not. I could have already had the medication given intranasally while, uh, while someone else is starting an IV.